Welcome back, dear listeners, to this week's edition of Wasteland Active Radio. As always, I'm your gracious host, Crispy. Before we begin the show, I have a question. Has anyone seen Atlas recently? After last week's outburst, Atlas just sort of disappeared. People say that they've seen him around, but nobody's been able to pinpoint where he's at. He's probably still sulking after failing to kill Macklin. You know, the leader of the super mutant army that's making its way here, drawing closer every day. Like, I get it. He messed up, and things seem a lot worse than he made them out to be when he first told us about the army. Eh, whatever. He'll get over it eventually. Right? Hmm. Moving on. Let's get this show on the road. We've got back up on the way from HQ, and the Dashwoods are preparing to move the non-combatants to a safe location. More on this in announcements. Bucket just got a huge update. Let's see what he can do in this week's weather forecast. Horses, harvest, and... Uh, what's a word for banquet that starts with H? It, we're having a party to celebrate the harvest. More on that in today's local news. As for on the scene, if I can't find Atlas, I don't know what we're going to do this week. But I'll make it work in this week's edition of On the Scene. Man, with Atlas being gone, I'm completely thrown off my game. I forgot to prepare for this week's open table. But I can improvise something. So worry not, dear listeners, the show will go on. So let's move on to this week's announcements. In today's announcements, we've just received word that the reinforcements that Major Sterling requested from HQ are going to be here within the next two weeks. We've been assured that these reinforcements are some of the best that the daring Dashwoods have to offer. I'm told that these reinforcements will include specialists who almost exclusively deal with super mutants and are some of the finest soldiers the Dashwoods have to offer. The more I hear about this, the fewer knots I feel in my stomach. I know that I put on a brave face and never ever panic or break down or cry in the basement where no one can find or hear me, but dear listeners, it's hard to stay calm when an army of super mutants is about to break down your doors and tear down everything you've helped to build up. I have complete faith in the Dashwoods to try and keep us safe, and knowing that we've got more coming to help is reassuring. Major Sterling, Lieutenant Kowalski, and all the others in the Daring Dashwoods are some of the most trustworthy, dependable people I know. If I trust them, you can trust them. Trust me. Our next announcement, the Dashwoods have discovered an entrance to a vault. That's right, a vault tech vault, with an open door and everything. Now, a vault with an open door isn't exactly a reassuring discovery, considering that the door is supposed to stay closed, But the scouts have already done a false sweep of the vault, and discovered that, aside from a pack of feral ghouls wearing vault suits, the vault was empty. The Dashwood scouts managed to put down the ferals and secure the vault. Major Sterling has decided that before Macklin's army arrives, we'll be sending the non-combatants to take shelter in the vault until things have been deemed safe for them to return. If you, for whatever reason, are unable to join the fight against Macklin's army, A small detachment of our forces will be escorting any groups wishing to avoid the battle. Report to the center of town this upcoming Wednesday starting at 0600 hours. This group will leave at 0700 hours sharp and won't return until informed to do so. Mm, Still no sign of Atlas anywhere. He doesn't even have his field microphone with him, so I can't try and tap into that to figure out where he went. I can't believe I'm about to say this, but I'm actually kind of worried about him. I've gone through plenty of funks after messing something up. Hell, that's the whole reason I was able to survive the bombs dropping 200 years ago. But that's a story for another time. Maybe I can try and bait him into showing up. Hmm. You know, Atlas was pretty angry after the name he proposed for the town was shot down. Threatened to rip the arms off the guy who suggested Station Hill. Well, dear listeners, I'll need your help for this, though. Anybody and everybody who sees Atlas... Let him know. I'm the guy who suggested the name for Station Hill. Yep, that's right. I'm the one who did it. How much more obvious could it be? I live in the station on the hill. And the name just sort of rolls off the tongue. So everybody let Atlas know that I'm the one who beat out Atlas City, which was a terrible name. 
We're nowhere near big enough to be a city. It's like you weren't even thinking, Atlas. Come on. Well, the bait has been set. Now we play the waiting game. Until then, let's move on to this week's weather forecast. I've got some exciting news, dear listeners. Thanks to my friend Johnny's help, Bucket just downloaded himself a software upgrade. <laughs> now, like I've said before, I'm no robot technician, but I know that this upgrade can be nothing but good news. As for the bug that Johnny found that causes Bucket's signature existential crises, there is a chance that the upgrade fixed it, so we may now have a normal, non-haunted weather robot. Fingers crossed. Bucket, begin this week's weather forecast. Acknowledged. Activating weather forecasting program. Applying updates. Calendar script restored. Reticulating splines. Accessing previous weather logs. Comparing to satellite scan of Illinois, USA. Scan complete. Beginning weekly forecast for the week of June 16th, 2287. Currently, the temperature is 77 degrees Fahrenheit with a high of 78 degrees Fahrenheit and a low of 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Feels like 77 degrees. Cloudy with light rain expected throughout the day. Winds currently blowing at 9 miles per hour north by northeast. Monday, the temperature will have a high of 83 degrees with a low of 80 degrees. 32% chance of scattered showers. Cloudy, 82% humidity. Tuesday, the temperature will have a high of 88 degrees with a low of 84 degrees. 37% chance of scattered showers. Cloudy, 88% humidity. Wednesday, the temperature will have a high of 90 degrees with a low of 90 degrees. 100% chance of thunderstorms. 99% humidity. Warning! Gusts of wind up to 25 miles per hour. Eastward winds. Wind speeds will drop to 12 miles per hour near 1800 hours. Thursday, the temperature will have a high of 95 degrees with a low of 94 degrees. 40% chance of scattered showers. Overcast. 92% humidity. Friday, the temperature will have a high of 99 degrees with a low of 94 degrees. 38% chance of scattered showers. Slightly cloudy. 87% humidity. Saturday, the temperature will have a high of 98 degrees with a low of 97 degrees. 12% chance of scattered showers. Slightly cloudy. 85% humidity. Forecast complete. Running diagnostics and printing satellite photographic scans. Now that's what I call a weather forecast. More informative than before, a little more focused and concise, and most importantly, no existential breakdowns. Great job, Bucket. If I could feel your amusement over my plight would disgust me. Move along, please. And there's today's quota of existential breakdowns. Thank you, Bucket. Your services are no longer needed for today. Return to your charging station. This emptiness is agony. Well, that's today's weather out of the way. Let's move on to today's local news. In 
today's local news, rancher Ronald King, with the help of the Daring Dashwoods, has successfully tamed the pack of wild horses that the Dashwood scouts found last week. They managed to corral the horses in a small valley and spent the next several days breaking the horses. I don't understand the lingo of it all. I really hope they didn't just take baseball bats to the horses' knees. I feel like that'd be counterintuitive. Well, whatever they did, the Dashwoods have put together a cavalry unit that are currently training with the horses. I've gotten some glimpses of them outside the walls from here, and I gotta say that they look majestic. Long, strong legs, flowing manes, fiery clouds coming from their mouth with each breath, thunderous hoof steps. Ah, the beauty of nature. I'm hoping that this will be nothing but a boon for the Dashwoods. We can use any advantage we can get against Macklin and his army. And our next piece of news, our crops have bloomed. Is bloomed the right word? Whatever. We've harvested a bunch of the plants we've grown, and the Charlestons are happy to say that the yield is, and I quote, greater than we've expected. The crops came in far sooner than we suspected, and we'll be getting ready to plant the second phase of our crop rotation before long. That's great news, but what kind of irks me is that, even though I'm no farmer, I remember growing up in the Midwest with fields of corn and beans as far as the eyes can see, out when you're driving those country roads, and they didn't truly start harvesting until late summer. I don't know, like I said, I'm no farmer, so I'm not gonna look a gift horse in the mouth. With that in mind, in celebration of the harvest, we'll be having a feast tomorrow evening. The Dashwood cooks will be preparing the meals and will start serving at 1800 hours and will run for the next four hours. If you're looking to help out with the cooking or serving, you can report to the mess hall outside of the barracks. They'll begin preparing the food at 1600 hours and could definitely use the help. Shocking everyone, I'll be joining the serving crew and assisting until the feast is over. That's right, I'm actually helping out for once. I just want the people of Station Hill to know that I care, and it has absolutely nothing to do with a certain power armor wearing hero putting me on a guilt trip. That just reminded me, dear listeners, though I don't know why, there was going to be a town hall meeting on taxes and a bunch of other boring garbage that I was supposed to report on. Instead, Major Sterling cancelled the meeting, and instead turned it into a war council to prepare for Macklin's approaching army of super mutants. A lot got done, but the Major requested that I don't broadcast it in case Macklin listens to the show. Honestly, the thought that Macklin might be listening is a little frightening. But that's beside the point. Well, that's the news out of the way, so let's move on to today's advertisements. Today's episode of Wasteland Active Radio is brought to you by the following sponsors. Ooh, I gotta put on my movie announcer voice. <laughs> this summer, from the depths of hell comes the year's most terrifying film. They thought they'd stopped it. They thought they were safe. But hell comes knocking twice. In a small town in the heartland of America, an old enemy threatens to destroy the American spirit and dismantle democracy. Red Menace 2, Russia Strikes Back. Starring America's favorite son, Jack Rhodes, and America's sweetheart, Mary Ann Vincent. Red Menace 2 will take you on a thrill ride of horrors as the ghost of Joseph Stalin finds his way onto American soil to avenge the fall of his nation by planting the seeds of communism in the minds of American teens, brainwashing them and starting an army of communist zombies. Jack Rhodes plays Buck Lincoln, star quarterback of his high school's football team, with the help of private investigator Jessica Washington played by Mary Ann Vincent. They attempt to save the brainwashed and zombified teens from the clutches of Joseph Stalin. You'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll have your patriotism reinvigorated. Red Menace 2, Russia Strikes Back. Coming soon to a theater near you. Ah, the Red Menace movies really started going downhill after this one. The rest were all straight to hollow tape. But they were tolerable until Red Menace 9, Lenin vs. Mao, a match made in communist hell. It was a pretty cool crossover, but the overall quality dropped hard. Eh, Moving on. Wasteland Active Radio is also brought to you by Yumco Corn. 
That's right. Yumko has officially brought corn back, baby. Your favorite sweet, crunchy, fresh off the cob vegetable is back in force. Buy your can of Yumko corn today. I don't know what these guys were on. Corn didn't go anywhere. I feel like we're starting to scrape the bottom of the barrel with these ads here. Eh. Anyway, we're also brought to you by the Brookfield Zoo. For the next month, we'll be featuring Gary the Rhino from the Cincinnati Zoo as part of our focus on the majesty of the African savanna. Say goodbye to Frank the Giraffe and say hello to Gary the Rhino starting this August at the Brookfield Zoo. You know, I wonder if any of the animals in zoos got ghoulified. Scientific term right there. And if they got turned into ghouls, I wonder if they're still kicking around. I'd love to see a ghoul event just pounding across the plains. I'd run on its back like, Bow before me, peasants! Bow before the Gulafant King and tremble in fear! <laughs> anyway, that's all the ads for today. So let's move on to our next subject. Atlas, can you hear me? Atlas, come in! Atlas! Well, he's still not here and still not responding. I guess he hasn't taken the bait yet. So instead of our regularly scheduled programming, I'll regale you all with a tale from my time wandering with Johnny. <clears throat> Let's see, which story should I tell? Oh, I got it. I'm going to tell you all about the time Johnny and I faced off against the raider boss, Rust King. You see, Rust King, like Johnny, had a thing for robots, but in a more intimate way. While he had a pretty large number of pleasure bots, he had a pretty big group of war bots that he used to back up his human officers and ruled his little slice of the wastelands with a literal iron fist. Now, this is where Johnny and I come in. <clears throat> Johnny and I were in a scrapyard about a week's travel northeast of Station Hill. Johnny was looking for parts to repair an old iBot we'd found a few days before while I was looking for anything worth trading. Rust King's bots ambushed us while we were searching, and the officers with them decided to take us to their boss after they saw Johnny's gear. Figured their boss wouldn't mind another officer who knew how to work with bots. So we get gagged, bagged, and hogtied before the boss loaded us up on a stick to carry us. About an hour later, Johnny and I are on our knees in front of the Rust King himself. He had a couple of assaultrons hanging off him, dressed like French maids, and fawning over him in his rusty throne. So he stands up, pushing his robot pleasure bots aside, and starts acting all high and mighty while looking Johnny and me up and down like choice cuts of meat. He asks Johnny what we were doing out in his scrapyard. So Johnny starts talking, but he starts stuttering and stumbling over his words, and then I get an idea. I chime in and say, I'm sorry, sir. But my friend here is what they call an idiot savant. He's amazing at working with robots, but he can barely wipe his own ass. Can't even say his own name right. Right, Johnny? And Johnny just looks at me like I grew a third head. But he catches on and just starts bobbing his head up and down like a goofball. Russ King just stares at us. I think he was staring. He wore an iBot chassis like a helmet, so I couldn't really see his face. But he stares at us and just says, All right, let's put that to the test. So Russ King and his boys drag us over to Russ King's workshop. Rusty's boys plop us down in front of something taller than Johnny and myself combined that's covered in a tarp. His boys rip off the tarp and show us the biggest sentry bot we've ever seen. It's clearly something RK had been working on for a while. Now, I've never seen Johnny's eyes get as big as that before. <laughs> but he's just staring at this thing all slack-jawed when Rust King tells Johnny to make it work. I bump Johnny and tell him the same thing. Just playing the role I'd made for myself there as Russ King's boys untie him. So Johnny gets up and gets to work, pulling off panels, stripping and fusing wires, tapping away on the bot's built-in keyboard, and after an hour, he manages to get this thing to turn on. Russ King is amazed. He'd been working on that thing for years, he tells us, and he was happy to welcome Johnny into his gang, but he'd be getting rid of me. His boys pull a gun and start moving to execute me, when suddenly the sentry bot starts charging its lasers and unleashes a rain of laser fire on Rust King and his boys. <laughs> Turns out Rust King was never able to hack into his prize bot, 
so he wasn't able to tell it who its friends were, and Johnny took advantage of that. He set it to attack everyone except for him and me before he cut me loose and we started hauling ass out of there. We get out of Russ King's base, an old hangar at an airfield, and about half a mile out I say to Johnny, great job kid, but why are we still running? He doesn't even get time to answer when we both get knocked off our feet by an explosion. I turn back and see Russ King's hangar gone and a mushroom cloud in its place. Johnny tells me he rigged Rust King Sentry Bot to explode, but because of the amount of fusion cores powering it, Johnny didn't know how far to run. <laughs> I laughed for a solid five minutes before puking from the run. <laughs> uh, good times, good times. Well, still no word from Atlas, so how about another? Oh! Where is he? There he well, is. I find that ghoul, I'll rip his arms off and- You thieving worm! You nepotistic sycophant! Atlas City was destined to win, and you salted the earth upon which I would build paradise! Hello, Atlas. How have you been? <sighs> Give me one reason why I shouldn't rip off your arms and beat you to death with your own fists! You won't do it. I'm too handsome. You make an interesting point. I've reconsidered my options, and I've come to a conclusion. And what would that be? I've come to the conclusion that I'd rather just strangle you to death! Wait. Atlas, stop. You're better than this. <sighs> Blast it. You're right. <coughs> of course I'm right. I can read you like a book. <coughs> uh, you're like a third grade reading level tops. <coughs> uh, uh, I've got an idea. You might like it. <coughs> I don't care. Uh, just, just hear me out. First, let it be known... We are broadcasting across all of the Ash Flats. With that in mind, second point, I occasionally host a segment called What's Under My Skin, where I, uh, where I air grievances that are on my mind at the time. I was thinking, maybe you've got something under your skin? Hmm. Is this something... You would use to express concerns? That sounds well within the bounds of whatever it takes to get you out of the slump you've been in, and prevents you from killing me. <clears throat> so, Atlas, what's under your skin? Hmm. Well, I suppose what is beneath my flesh is Macklin and his army coming to destroy this settlement. Yeah? And why is that? If Macklin and his army succeed, he will attempt to mutate the people of this outpost using his stores of the forced evolutionary virus. While I am sure there are a fair number here that would survive the virus's effects, most of them would certainly die. This is a sacrifice I'd be willing to make if the FEV had a far higher chance of successfully mutating humans. Wait, what? Even if it had a 100% chance of survival, the damage it does to the mind negates the true potential of the virus. Humans are so small and weak. But their intellect is what allowed them to rise above the animals. 
The super mutants created from Macklin's samples of FEV lack the intellect and problem-solving skills of the humans they once were. They're complete and utter morons! <sighs> humans are so soft and fragile. They need to be protected, cultivated. The FEV has the capabilities to make the humans greater than they are, and if it weren't for the mental degradation, the low survival rate, and the sterility the virus causes, the FEV would be a veritable philosopher's stone, pushing humanity to evolve into something greater. That's... I... I don't even know how to respond to that. Understandable. I too am distraught over humanity's squandered potential. When I was turned into a super mutant, I lost all memories of my previous life and wandered the wasteland as a little more than a violent, brutish buffoon. One day I was shot in the head and my regenerative qualities began to repair the damage. I theorized that I was able to regenerate the damage done to my brain from the virus as well. While I can't remember my previous life, I felt the need to help humanity and raise them up from the ruin that they've created for themselves. I believe this is the only remaining trace of my previous memories. Well... I may not agree with your reasoning, but I can appreciate the sentiment at least. Do you feel better now? I... I do. In fact, I feel better than I previously did. I am still... afraid... of the possibility that Macklin will destroy this settlement. But my anxiety has been eased for the time being. No need to thank me. Oh, I won't. What? I still owe you for ruining my chance at creating Atlas City. W wait wait hold up! There. Now you are forgiven. This is the end of the show. I believe the ghoul ends each installment with what I'm sure he believes are words of wisdom. I am the most intelligent and the wisest being in this settlement, so listen closely. Humans are no longer the apex predator in this world. Though they retain the potential to return to the second highest link of the food chain, because once we discover a foolproof strain of the forced evolutionary virus, super mutants will claim their rightful place at the top of the food chain, watching over the lesser humans like a beloved flock of helpless livestock. This has been the Ghoul's Weekly News Radio Program. I am Atlas. And I order you to cease listening! Wasteland Active Radio is created, written, and produced by Z. Hagen and J. Wilson. Performed by Z. Hagen, J. Wilson, and B. Seawick. Brought to you by the record button. Wasteland Active Radio is set in the Fallout video game universe, owned by ZeniMax Media and Bethesda Softworks. No copyright infringement is intended. Please support the official release. 
An additional note, the song that you are currently listening to, Lobby Time, is by Kevin McLeod at Incomputech.com, licensed under Creative Commons, Attribution 3.0. Thank you. Crispy. Uh, hey. Hey, wake up, man. Uh, what, what happened? Looks like you got your bell rung, brother. I was listening to your show like I do every week, and so I heard Meat Mountain come in and, and treat your throat like a tube of toothpaste. Uh, don't, don't say it like that. Yep. Yep. Why... Why do I taste garlic? Oh, oh yeah. They're serving garlic bread in the mess hall. I wasn't sure what would help you, so I just started with mouth to mouth. Stop, stop. Don't put that image in my head. Oh, dear lord. Was... Was there any garlic bread left?